Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Sundance's National Poetry Month reading series. Thank you so much for joining us for the final reading of what has been a fantastic series. And while we're sad to see it come to a close, we're already looking forward to next year when hopefully we can all be together in the store again. So please get your vaccines, both of them. Today, we will be hearing from revered poets, June Sylvester Saracino, Krista Lucas, and Tom Masheri. Now, please join me in welcoming our guide through the final reading, Sean Griffin. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sundance. Thanks to everyone who's reached out in Etherland to support this series. I know it's been tough this month because we've had to talk to each other on a screen, but we've had some great readings and we're gonna finish with a great reading tonight. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to, to listen to three uh, dear friends who are fine poets. Um, and they'll be sharing work from um, their books and also new poems. But before I do that, I wanna read a poem from Laura Weatherington's new collection. She, as you know, is in uh, Holland right now and cannot be with us today, but uh, were she here, she'd be reading from some of these poems. This poem's entitled, Pressing at the Base of the Sky after Deborah Heisler. The power of mountains, pregnant movements, pressing at the base of sky. The human hand holds 27 bones. Spring signals promise, a clear yes resounding in green. You will live a long life, yes. Here, this broken line shows a child and this one, another. When there are no predictions to capture the summer, we work with our hands. Grounding an absence quite complicated, the contact between each digit, a little listening, what we lose will amount to silence. And that's from Laura Weatherington's new book, Parallel Resting Places. So welcome to her when she gets to see this on the other side of the pond. Again, a great welcome to all of you out there in Etherville. And uh, I'm thrilled. This is our final evening for Poetry Month, our 22nd year. And although we can't be gathered in the beautiful house on California, we're gathered here. So our first reader tonight will be June Saracino. <clears throat> June, as many of you know, teaches English at uh, Sierra Nevada College. And she is the author of several books. Her most recent collection of poetry, The Girl from Yesterday, was released by Cherry Grove in 2020. And she, like so many, had books come out during the pandemic and has not had a chance to do many, if any, public readings. And she's thrilled to be able to do that from this book. Her previous books were Dirt and Tar, Altars of Ordinary Light, and her first novel, Feral, North Carolina. Please give a warm welcome to June Saracino. Thanks, Sean. Thank you so much, Sean. And uh, thanks, Emily and Sundance Books for hosting these readings. They're wonderful. I look forward to them all year. Um, such, a, such a great gift that you give to the community. I'm going to be reading, as Sean said, from my latest collection, The Girl From Yesterday. But I'm also at work on a second novel, which takes place in France. And um, many of the poems in this book actually were written during a residency in France. So I'm focusing kind of on the poems that uh, have something to do with France, mainly because that's where my head is right now. So you might pick up on, <laughs> on a little theme here. The first one I'm going to read is called Outside the Metro. Outside the Metro, so many outstretched palms, those empty cups as I pass by, an O of need and hunger, an upturned hat beside a guitar with only three strings left to strum. Behind the one with dreads, a siren well, a babe without a bottle. As I go by, I wish myself invisible or earless or better more prepared, more providing. I have no bread, no fish. My jeans indict me. My silk scarf knots my neck in paisley judgment. I wish I could conjure the scent of jasmine, a bloom to vanquish the stench of piss in this ancient alley. 
If only that coat of many colors could drape us all, cover the lot of us as we huddle together and remember how once we were brothers. Um, I'm sure you've all seen those scenes, the, the ones that tear at your heart and, and make you realize how very fortunate you are. The next one is a little bit more of an introspective uh, look viewing out um, over the top of Paris. It's called Rooftops. The rooftops are alight with sunset. They peak and flatten simultaneously. They promise nothing. The sky stretches past the rooftops into infinity, into whatever eternity is. Whatever it is, it is blue. The rooftops wood and slate, the rooftops plank and bird, they are endless outside the frame of this window. They speak of other lives. Some dive forward, some retreat. They converse in the beyond. The rooftops, plank and bird. The rooftops, blue and sunset. So, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot and working on, and one of the things that uh, is part of this book and part of um, fingers crossed the forthcoming one is a focus or an attention to, uh, you know, the liminal spaces, you know, when you first wake up while you're still sort of in a dream and you're also awake, that sort of, that, that area between sleeping and waking, um, different types of consciousnesses and, you know, and also um, I mentioned, I wrote most of this while I was in a residency in France, the idea of borders, you know, going, moving between borders, moving from one place to another. So this next poem is an attempt to look at the sense of um, liminal spaces within our own body. So what I mean by that is when, you know, um, when I think of myself at 20, I think of myself as a person that I know and care about. And, but it's like, it's another person. I'm not that same person. Even the cells in my body have turned over. Like I'm literally not that same person, but I literally am because my DNA literally is. But there's that sense of uh, being more than one person and, and different people in you that, that kind of come out at different times and spaces. So um, we've all had that experience, I think, where, where we're in a situation and all of a sudden it's almost as if we were in a different time. We were, you know, experiencing a time that we've already experienced or maybe we've jettisoned forward. But um, that is what is the focus of this next poem. And it's, um, and I'm on, on a bike in the poem. It's actually based on experience of riding and, and um, not just feeling like the 10 year old again, but that sense of being myself simultaneously one age and simultaneously another. So it's called Riding a Bike at Dusk in Marne. The air, an aviary of chitterings, cheeps. The air, a prism of mist on my face, scented with dank green earth, rippled by a quick startle of wings. A woman's body moves through this space, but a girl emerges from the green tunnel, unconfined to now, so that I am her again, and her, then her. The interminable longing to loft, to lift, true as veins under skin, threading past to future in this present moment. As in dreams when the world reshapes, this shift from one breath to another, this merging of here and gone. How open the heart is in transit how the body moves to reclaim itself each instant. 
The trees wave their wet leaves. These are not tears. And I have two more. Uh, one, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, last one from my book, and then I'm going to read someone else's poem. So this last one is still on that same wavelength of uh, liminality, of being in different places simultaneously. And it has an epigram from L.P. Hartley, um, the past is a foreign country. And again, I was, I was in a foreign country writing this, but what I was writing about was my, was my childhood in a sense, which was also a foreign country. <laughs> so, um, so that liminality is another, you know, it's present in this poem too. And the very last phrase of this poem, the very last line is by Rilke. And it's from a, a stunningly beautiful poem called Evening. And so that's the one I really uh, want to end on. But I thought I would read this one and then, and then put the icing on the cake with Rilke. So, <clears throat> a small village in France. The past is a foreign country, L.P. Hartley. Musical voices rise to my room from the street below, greeting, commenting on weather, calling dogs, accents mingling with my dreams, the unshuttered, half-awake early hours. A church bell tolls, sends me back to the small island of childhood. Sunday worshipers walk the narrow lanes, my stiff shoes, crinoline in solemn motion. Mother, would take my hand along the way. A chorus of morning doves braids the trinity of time. Cats snooze in windowsills, hens peck at pebbles. A phrase from Roca crosses the border into consciousness to neither quite belonging. And I love that poem of his so much that that's what I want to close on. As I mentioned, it's called Evening. You can find it online. It has many translations because I'm not the only one that loves this poem a lot. Um, I think some translations are better than others. And I tried to find the, the person that I could give credit to for translating this one, but I only found the translation and couldn't find his name. So maybe I'll, I'll try harder and look for that and post that in, in the comments section later. Evening by Rainier Maria Rilke. Slowly the evening puts on the garments held for it by a rim of ancient trees. You watch and the lands divide from you, one going heavenward, one that falls and leaves you to neither quite belonging. Not quite so dark as the house sunk in silence, not quite so surely pledging the eternal as that which grows to star each night and climbs. It leaves you inexpressibly to untangle your life, fearful, immense, and ripening. So that now bound up, now embracing, it grows alternately stone in you and star. Yay for Rilke. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, can't wait to hear Krista's poems. So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, June. And thank you, Rilke, wherever you are. Oh yeah, that was lovely. Um, good to hear that sort of French pastiche took me away. Our next reader tonight is Krista Lucas, and she also is a friend of many of you. <clears throat> She's the author of the poetry collection, Fans of My Unconscious. Several poems have been selected for the Best American Poetry and the Writer's Almanac. And she's also gonna read from some new work. Let's give a warm welcome to Krista, Krista Lucas. COVID-19, a microbial jack-in-the-box that can slip in closed, slip in unseen, pop open any time, pop open and begin making of itself copy, 
after copy after copy. Blown up with color, it becomes a succulent with a dash of purple. Corona, crown in Spanish, a lovely word as the virus itself is lovely in its wicked, deadly way. All around it jumps out at me, a peacock weather vane, a mandala, a tangle of curled ribbons, a paint splatter, even the back of a waiting room chair. I post on social media an out of context photo. What does this look like? Lilies of the Nile, dandelions, x-rays of sea anemones, jellyfish, coral, daisies, like, like, like. Along with these, I see neurons, sunspots, a distant galaxy. Corona, crowned, floral, floating, rolling, spinning, jellyfish, coral, physician, hospital, coughing, wheezing, aching, infectious, stealthy corpse. I'm reading poems organized around the idea of fragility, of ourselves as individuals, as the human race, of our planet in one solar system, in one galaxy, in one universe. I don't have COVID-19, but I do have a glioblastoma, an always stage four malignant brain tumor. It may sound familiar. It's the same type of tumor that caused the death of Bo Biden and John McCain. Glioblastoma, more poetic than malignant tumor the size of a baseball, sounds better than a growth squeezing the bejesus out of my brain or smashing it gradually into my skull Glioblastoma, a little violent because of blast right in the middle, but even in my psychosis, when I believed I'd been Shakespeare and that someone was shooting patients, I caught its nickname, Glio. That's what I would say when anyone asked, do you know why you're here? I would say, I had a Glio. Glee, lightheartedness, delight, merriment, plus, oh, an exclamation of pain or surprise. And I always said had rather than have, because having had the surgery, I felt certain and relieved that the entire thing was behind me. Before my glio was dug out, or in medical terms, resected, I had be been feeling slow and disconnected from the world around me. Bliss to Emerald Bay. We walked on a path carved into the side of a cliff. Skyward rose a forested slope and earthward a plunging into the deepest blue. Last time, the beauty was astounding. Now, it struck me only as an impression, distant and faint. Oh, the brain surgery would have done the trick. Then I only would have been at risk for having a seizure, standing, walking, driving, ladder climbing, dancing, hearing more than three words at a time. No, I needed further treatments. These came with a host of uncomfortable side effects. At first, I wondered why the paper cuts on my eyelids and earlobes. Then I noticed I was being careful of my fingernails. 
thinking for once I might need to file them. When actually, they had become thin, the edges sharp blades. To sleep, I would need to be suspended. No contact with fabric or heat of any kind. I would need to be cool, to be held weightless. After brain surgery, I stayed in the ICU where the bed and sheets were divinely comfortable and where it was nearly impossible to get any rest. They wake you up every hour to check your vitals. There was construction involving a jackhammer and the Blue Angels were doing an air show. All a recipe for ICU delusions in combination with having my skull cut open. So, again, I awake in a future life. Glimpse a calendar with a future number on it. Next time a nurse wants to know the year, I try to remember something 35. When my husband appears, I ask, what millennium is it? He says, Oh, millennium, that's always the hardest one. I am dismayed. If millennium is hard, what about century? What about year? My husband has something to say. He has moved on, married someone new, has children with her. He speaks a language I don't recognize. He explains as kindly as such a thing can be explained. He cannot take me in. My mother is angry, he said this, and he is furious with her. She does not want me either. I overhear my sister and her husband talking, their kids, the farm, how busy they are. We all know what my diagnosis means. My family thought I was gone already. I have been forgotten. In that delusion, one of many, I believed not only that I was in a future life, but that I had dementia. My grandmother had Alzheimer's during her last years, but she was a ready and willing listener anytime I wanted to read a poem to her. She never could get used to the lack of rhyme though. Her response was the same every single time. I'm sorry, but I don't think that's a poem at all. This one's for her. Grandma, just shy of 91, thinks she is 12 again or maybe 20, asks for the hundredth time have you seen my folks? I'm worried sick. I haven't heard from them all day. Long dead when I was born, they live in black and white photographs, her stories. Back when she remembered, she would tell about camping, how they drive the Packard on gravel roads from San Francisco to Monterey, Big Sur, one time up to Canada how her mother sewed their sleeping bags with sand dollar sized buttons along the edge, how her daddy tied his shaving mirror to a tree. They slept in a canvas tent, stored meat in a basket lined with asbestos and tin, used milk bottles to hold water. They're fine, I tell her, they're all right. Her hand feels soft in mine her skin papery and thin. My grandma knows a world without zippers, nylon, the atomic bomb. If you ask her what today is, she says, well, yesterday it was tomorrow.
My grandparents never spent a night apart, even at the end of his life when he fell into a coma. I hope you know I've stayed by your side, eaten the fruit cups and spaghetti, meals they bring three times a day. Again and again, I say thank you for 66 years. You gave me a good life. You've been a good husband. Our children came, sat with me, held your hand. Bruce's eyes teared up the whole time. I haven't seen him cry for 50 years. Our granddaughter stood by your bed. Krista rested her head on your chest, said into your good ear, don't try to answer. You've said all you need to say. Robbie held the baby by your side, guided her little hand to grasp your finger. At the door told her, wave bye-bye. Last weekend, the doctors told me a day or two and here it is Thursday. You always did everything in extremes. The boys drank too much milk, so you bought a cow. You wanted a garden, so you traded our house for a farm. You worked until four in the morning to get a job done. And now your heart keeps beating without you. I want to go home, sleep in our bed, sort the mail, throw away the food rotting in the refrigerator. But I don't even walk down the hall. Any breath now could be your last. As long as you're here, I have something to do. When I go home, I will be a widow. Some would say, if I want what's best for our earth and oceans and future, I should consume no animal products or at least limit myself to that which is produced humanely and on a small scale. I shouldn't eat grapes picked by underpaid workers, grain grown in raised forests. I shouldn't consume anything that has been, been transported a great distance shouldn't shop in stores run by underpaid employees. I shouldn't buy products made of plastic or wrapped. I shouldn't throw the plastic in the trash. I shouldn't throw away aluminum, tin, glass, paper, anything. I shouldn't drive a car or fly on planes. I shouldn't bear children, but if I must, I should have only one and I should not spoil it. I shouldn't diaper the baby in disposables or use water to wash cloth. I shouldn't live in a big house and shouldn't heat or cool it using electricity or gas. I shouldn't dry my clothes in a dryer, take baths or long showers. I shouldn't leave the tap running while I wash dishes or brush my teeth. I shouldn't water my yard on odd days or even. I shouldn't become attached to things and shouldn't hoard them. I shouldn't enable addictions, give unsolicited advice, get overstressed, consider drugs, or commit suicide. I shouldn't judge others or be too hard on myself. I shouldn't think negative thoughts, complain, or fail to appreciate how good I have it. I shouldn't wonder if I should ever have been born. Losing teeth. I miss losing teeth, the gradual loosening, rocking a tooth back and forth, day by day, the surrendering of the hold. I miss the last hours, especially the last hanging on by ligaments, the sounds of tiny rips and the falling out. Or because I usually lacked patience, the push or the yank, the dental floss noose, the slamming of the bathroom door, the final tear, and then the soft spot under, pulp, not quite blister, smooth, almost sweet to taste. 
I miss the gap, something gone where something was, and the feel of the sides of the neighbor teeth. I miss cradling a tooth in my hand, careful not to wash it down the drain, rinsing off the blood, the sharpness of the root on my fingertip, putting it dry in an envelope, offering it up, coins under my pillow next morning. I miss the nudge of the new crown, one white ridge at a time, the texture of new enamel. I miss the second chance, the in-between, the some baby teeth, some permanent, the halfway there, little by little, my mouth, the thrill of what I thought was growing When my grandfather was 87, he went to the DMV to renew his driver's license and the clerk said, here you go. This one's good for another four years. Grandpa said, is that a guarantee? I have the same question about the forever stamp. USA first class written alongside the cracked Liberty Bell, 42 cents good for an ounce, good through the depletion of fossil fuels, the rise of oceans, the desert's expansion, the disappearance of the atmosphere as we know it. Good in domes and through world wars, accepted by all mail carriers in all countries for all time, none of whom will ever laugh in the face of an optimist who once invested in stickers good through exponential growth, the spread of new viruses, meteors, A-bombs and H-bombs, letter bombs, the nuclear winter, the return to sticks and stones. Good when only cockroaches remain, scuttling in the rubble to find forever stamps so they can mail themselves to planets with younger stars for sons. Are you finished, Krista? That was an amazing reading. Wow. Thank you. Those poems were um, they were breathtaking. And Thank what you. A, what a beautiful and searing image into COVID. Wow. Thank you very much. No good stuff. So our next reader is uh, no stranger to all of you. Tom Sherry, as you well know, has many lives. Uh, MBA, great, uh, wonderful English teacher, wonderful poet, and friend to many, many people out there in Etherland. Uh, he's going to be reading from his new chapbook, Time Out. He has several other books out. Um, most of you are aware of them. Uh, nothing You Can Lose Can Be Replaced, Some Men, Sweat, and New and Selected Poems About Sports. Let's give a warm welcome to our good friend Tom Sherry from Sacramento today. Thank you, Sean. Greetings to all you great folks in Nevada. Boy, I really missed uh, crossing the border and visiting Reno and my daughter in Sierra Ville. But now that COVID is kind of straightening out slightly, I plan to hit, hit the road. So uh, look for me in Nevada very soon. I, I miss all of you folks. I just, you know, I miss our, our poetry readings uh, at the bookstore and I hope they will uh, continue and start again next year. Um, I am going to read from uh, Time Out. It's a chapbook that came out just, just before COVID hit last year. And it's uh, about 24 poems. And as you probably know, I write a lot about basketball, a lot about sports. Uh, they're the subject I know. Um, I'm sort of, I've always thought of myself as a narrative poet. And I like, uh, 
poems that cross over and uh, tell stories. And I like uh, stories that uh, cross over and turn into poems. So uh, I think my poems tell stories. I hope they're interesting stories. The first uh, poem I'm going to read is uh, entitled Soul. It is for Joe Cap. Joe Cap was a uh, great quarterback for the California Bears, the University of California Bears, and then had a, a tremendous career with the Minnesota Vikings in Canadian football league. Uh, he was a crazy wild man. And, uh, a lot of us jocks get together in the Bay Area and, uh, for luncheons every once in a while, and we discuss, uh, tell lies and about ourselves and discuss our grandchildren now that we're so old. And uh, Joe Cap was at this particular luncheon where we were there to honor uh, Pete Newell, who was a California Bears coach for years where he died. And uh, he embraced me uh, as I entered the room and uh, whispered in my ear the word soul. And that's all. And uh, out of that came this poem, Soul for Joe Cap. Yesterday, among men of my generation of athletes, gray-haired, aging, and aged, Joe Camp, wild man, Mexican Indian, famous for his exploits on the football field, still wild, there like the rest of us, to honor a great dead coach, embraced me. And I embraced back, hearing him whisper in my ear the word soul, as if he was imparting to me a special secret he discovered on his journey into the valley of dementia. Somebody knocks on the old modern pocket who gives a shit. Didn't we have a good time? Was he telling me I had a soul, or that souls were present in this room, laughing through the air with the bravado stories of our heroics? Oh, that we were ever so young and athletic and destined for greatness. Was he pouring from the cup of his mouth some special knowledge? into my ear, a warm and blessed liquid. Oh, my soul, was that you coming to me when I least expected, announcing your existence among so many good men through the mouth of this man, shaman of expletives, high priest of stories and fists and laughs and tears and hijinks that I recall left us all breathless, filled with good humor. Oh, Joe, quarterback, who never ran out of bounds because only gringos do. Wild, violent Joe, have you given me a parting gift, a piece of the internal puzzle? The second poem from this collection is entitled Old Man Hands. Hands. Uh, Old Man Hands. And it's for my wife, Melanie. And Melanie and I are senior citizens, and we've noticed over the years that our hands are somehow different than they were when they were 20. So uh, this poem comes out of that realization. I'm looking at my old man hand, blue veins showing through rice paper skin, blood bruises like ink blots. I turn my hand over and examine my palm, younger, I think, flesh still pink. My lifeline curving around my thumb, but at 80, who knows for how long? My index fingers are arthritic and look somewhat like a waning moon. I can't palm a basketball anymore. My old man fingers can no longer make a free throw. Tell me if that isn't pathetic. Unable to propel a 22 ounce ball 15 feet into the air, when my old man hands were young and old, they could grab a ball out of the air or out of my opponent's hands and fling the ball the length of the court. There are moments in my life when I still hear an arena of many hands clapping from my young man hands. On my office wall hangs a painting of a pen by Terry Gura. It drops gracefully down from the cloudy background. The muffles suggest it is the hand of a mature male. How I envy his age difference. I remember as a child in the midst of war among the ruins of Tokyo, I saw a child hand poking out of the rubble 
So you have never become an old man. Looking at you, I believe it's true that some say that you can hold your loved one's life in your hand. As I'm doing now, my old man hand reaching across to your old woman hand. My old college roommate, uh, John Shirley, who is wonderful fellow died two years ago. And uh, he was also on my, he was also on my St. Mary's College basketball team. Uh, he had a, a limb, which made it kind of extraordinary that he was such a good athlete. Uh, he was also absolutely brilliant. He got straight A's and never studied. I got studied all the time. He got B's and C's. It was very disheartening. Um, the title of this poem is "On Hearing on John, On Hearing of John's Death," and in the second line, there's a reference to a name, Ron. Ron is Ron Adams, who is the assistant coach of the Golden State Warriors, and he and I have struck up a friendship over the years because we both love poetry. And he sends me poems, and I send him poems, and then uh, we talk about basketball and how Steph Curry is shooting and so on. Um, on hearing of John's death. Got an email from Ron with a poem about the wind that is a gift. On the day I needed one, I was heard of the death of my college roommate, the best and only one rugged basketball player in the history of St. Mary's College. He'd lived past you for a layup if you weren't careful. So smart, he barely studied his sophomore year and got straight A's and nearly drove me out of my mind learning instead of reading the classics. When I was struggling with the deck the quick senator of the Iliad, how to play one fucking song, Easy Rider on his guitar. The same note over and over. And the poem Ron sent me goes with the wind sounding like a blue harmonic. It arrived at the Pittsburgh crisis all the way from Crete, all this time of the solar system, which is where perhaps. If one does not believe in heaven. My roommate John is now driven towards by the wind, fierce wind of his life, no longer limping, but sure footed, past people, past all other undiscovered planets, the moon and sun, and the dark matter of our lives. I'm going to read a poem from uh, a new collection that's almost done. I'm probably about, I'd say maybe about five poems short. Uh, the title of the book is Tentatively Clear Path. But that may change. Uh, this story is, uh, this poem is, see, I get stories, poems, I don't know what it's It's all, it's all literature, I guess. Um, this is based on a true event that happened. Bob Hass, Robert Hass, and I got a went together at St. Mary's College. And prior to his reading, when we got to the podium, he recounted a story about me uh, in a freshman year hanging from the dorm the second floor of the dormitory window and uh, reciting a, a poem by Rambeau called Plateau Reed. So this is the poem that's entitled Pato Evil for Robert Hatch. I don't remember who it was hanging from the rim following a dunk, a warrior, but nameless in my hatred's memory. But there I was suddenly listening to my history of hanging from an upper floor dormitory window, reciting in a drunken voice Rambo's Pato Evil. The drunken host. The witness was himself a poet, and of a magnitude that I could not question his recollection of me. Both of us in college, he studying classics, he studying basketball. He would have found his way to that landing and delighted in it, knowing that at some point in time it would be worth recalling for an audience. And I was.
would have had no idea at the time that my foray into French symbolism would lead me to a chair listening to him describe me teetering on the edge of something much more fragile than a window ray. But had I let go, I might have lived a different life. Tom, excuse me, can you move a little closer to the microphone and it might, we might be able to hear you a little better? Okay. Thank Is you. Better? That's better, thank you. Is it all jumbled? Did you miss all the poems? Uh, I could hear, but not clearly through all of them. But thank you. Just a little closer. I think we'll be fine. Okay. All right. Well, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna head on. You want me to repeat them? Oh no! <laughs> please do. I just want you to be closer so we can get we can make out what you're saying right. better. That's all. Uh, as I said, I write a lot of poems about poetry, and I think I've kind of run out of subject matter after all these years. I finally decided I might. I need to. To change subjects, break away a little bit, and write about some different subjects. And so I decided to and, and started a, I'm about five, ten poems into a, a manuscript that's uh, called British Literature. I taught British Literature at Reno High School for 20 years. And my wonderful AP students, if any of them are are watching this Zoom, hi, how are you? And uh, I hope you're doing marvelously well. And uh, I'm using the uh, our, the actual textbook that I taught with, um, and relating relying on each of the sections of that textbook to uh, uh, for subjects for for poetry. And this very first uh, poem is from the beginning of that textbook, and it's entitled "Angles and Saxons: Songs of Ancient Heroes." And there's a little. Um, Short introduction that's kind of that's directly out of the out of the textbook, and it reads like this: Rain drenched and often fogged in, but also green and dotted with thatched cottages, quaint stone churches, and mysterious stone ruins. The island of Great Britain seems made for elves, legends, and poets. And the title of the poem is Stonehenge. First came the crayons, then the roadmap to Stonehenge on paper placement, and a menu only a father cared to read. Primary colors strain outside the lines the way I suppose history strays from the truth. I laughed at the odd confusion of imagination and ordered fish and chips all around. Then came the purple unicorn and the pink thatched roofs, the troll at the door of the cottage welcoming us to the last stop for a hot meal before the mysterious stone ruin. Time, temple, of a vacation I took on a bicycle as a young man. I trace my finger on the road, counting miles, before my children grow up, how it will curve to the pastoral English countryside, changing the horizon. Now, the sea between England and Ireland is set afire by the willful pressure of Crayola and the Rhine. The text reads first, came the self, called Swift. Then tribes from the continent invaded, Angles and Saxons and the wild Norsemen. And finally, the poets came with their voices and stringed instruments, singing the legends that became my own version of bedtime stories. Tell us again about the Druids with lights, okay? I see now how those stones curve into the air, transformed into spaceships for love. That night I tucked them in, kissed each one, and watched as they drifted into sleep and into sleep. And that's it for me. And I want to thank all of you, and particularly I want to thank Sean. You know. If it wasn't for you, you know, Nevada would have 50% of least best poetry. You're the man. Thank you, Tom. That was a fine reading. I appreciate it. It's so good to see you. And uh, welcome, uh, from, welcome from Sacramento. Um, I like the new poems. I like where you're going with that. I want to thank all of our readers, Krista, June, and Tom, for just sharing some remarkable stuff tonight. Uh, Emily, is there 
comments or thoughts in the chat? We have a lot of complimentary viewers. I won't read the, the gushing, but uh, no questions. I just want to also say thank you all so much for being here, for sharing your time with us. And to all of our readers through the whole of the month, National Poetry Month, you know, we didn't really get to celebrate last year. So it's been so nice to come together this year, be it virtually. And um, I really hope that next year we're together. <laughs> Which we should be. We will be. We will be together. Yes, I sure hope so too. And uh, we'll all be at Sundance together next year. Yes. That's the theory. Yeah. I hope so I hope so. Well, again, if there's no um, questions or comments for the poets, this is your last chance. Put them in the YouTube chat. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in and. Um, Emily, are we good there? We are good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, June, Krista, and Tom. Thank you so much. Everyone, and everyone have a good evening. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.